everybody. Today we are debating whether or not giants of the Old Testament existed, and we're starting right now. Ladies and gentlemen, thrilled to have you here for this very exciting debate as we have two titans in the debate world online when it comes to religion and atheism. We are thrilled to have them here. They have been, I, I gotta say, like you guys are uh, two of our most frequent and I think uh, people just love to hear you guys debate. You guys are both very experienced. It's, it's uh, an honor to have you. So thanks for being with us. And want to let everybody know, both of their links are in the description. So that way, if you're like, oh, snap, I'm loving what I'm hearing. Well, good news. Their link is conveniently located below so that you can click on it and hear more of what they have to say. In addition, want to say if this is your first time here, consider hitting that subscribe button as we have regular debates on things like tomorrow, atheists versus Christians on aliens in the Bible, as well as many other topics coming up. So if you want reminders, hit that subscribe button and that little notification bell. And with that, we are going to jump right into this. We are going to give each side 12 minutes to make their opening statement, just kind of a general case for why giants from the Old Testament did exist. And then we will go into open discussion mode for the remainder until the Q&A. For the Q&A, if you have any questions that you would like to ask the speakers, please shoot them into the live chat. I will pull them into a list and we will ask those questions at the end. Be a lot of fun. Also, Super Chats, almost forgot. If you have a Super Chat, you can also make a comment toward one of the speakers to which they, of course, would get a chance to respond to. And we would ask, please help us out. We had somebody on Monday, we had a Snooper, uh, Super Chat sneak in that was, I would say, a personal attack. And so we are trying to ask, please don't send any sort of personal attacks these guys are here debating uh, just because they love to do it like they didn't ask anything in return so i feel like i'm personally indebted to them so we, we really want to honor them and with that we are going to jump over to kent hoven we appreciate you being here it's uh, great to have you back i'm going to set the timer for your opening and thanks gentlemen both for being here and kent the floor is yours well thank you sir it's an honor to be here and thank you tom for doing this uh you said you're a full-time debater on the philosophy uh, about reasons not to believe in God. That's interesting. <clears throat> okay. Um, did, did the giants mentioned in the Old Testament really exist? Well, my name's Kent Hovind. I taught high school science and math 15 years. We have a Christian campground in Lenox, Alabama, <clears throat> Dinosaur Adventureland, straight north of Pensacola. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 6, at the beginning of the Bible, there were giants in the earth in those days. I don't think it could be more clear. The Bible says there were giants, and we could stop the debate right there, but I'm going to give you my reasons why I believe it to be true. Number one, the Bible clearly teaches that people lived to be over 900 years of age before the flood came. Whether you believe it or not, it's a different story, but the Bible does say Adam was 130 when his son was born, and he lived to be 930 altogether, and Seth was 105, and you can look at the dates in Genesis 5 and make a chart like this. The Bible clearly says the people were living to be over 900 before the flood came. After the flood, things changed. And I cover all that in my seminar part two. What was different before the flood? Why did they live to be 900? So I'll stand by my ground that the Bible is real clear. They lived to be over 900 years of age. And probably because they had a perfect gene code. Actually, man was designed to live forever. So the fact that he owned a lived to be 900 is kind of sad. Uh, today, nobody makes it to 90 or 100 hardly. They had a perfect diet, perfect soil, increased air pressure, filtered sunlight. Lots of reasons I cover in my seminar number two. Secondly, there is historical evidence for what is called a golden age. Many ancient cultures talk about a time when man used to live to be a thousand or nearly a thousand. The golden age. They would say man lived to be a thousand, did not have to work to grow food, and died peacefully in his sleep. The term golden age comes from the Greek mythology, particularly the works of the days of Hesiod. And they talk about a time in humanity when they lived to be nearly a thousand. The first age was ruled by Kronos, the finisher. The finish of the first age was silver and then bronze. After this, the heroic age, which is, by the way, where we get our Olympic medals, the, the medal used in the Olympic medals. That's another story. Okay, golden age, a period of primordial peace, harmon harmony, stability, and prosperity. People did not have to work to feed themselves, and the earth provided food in abundance. They lived to a very old age with a youthful appearance, eventually dying peacefully with spirits living on as guardians. Plato recounts the golden age of humans who came first. 
Hesiod did not literally mean made of gold, but good and noble. It's like w Wikipedia teaches there was a golden age. Uh, Hesiod says there was a time when the earth produced food in such abundance there was no need for agriculture. Hmm. And when they died, it was like they were overcome with sleep and they had all, had everything was good. By the fifth century, they still talked about a golden age when man lived to be a really old. So I think there's plenty of evidence historically that at least people believed that man lived longer. That doesn't mean he was bigger necessarily, I understand. But certainly the Bible says they lived to be 900 plus, and ancient historical documents say man used to live to be 900 plus. The Bible says there was a firmament in the midst of the waters. The uh, firmament's where the birds fly in Genesis. I cover this on video too. The Bible teaches, I think, pretty clearly that there was water above the atmosphere, probably a layer of ice. I won't take time to cover all that right now, but if you watch my video too on drdino.com, <clears throat> we cover that in great detail. It says there was water under the firmament and water above the firmament. Psalm 148 says, Praise him, ye waters that be above the heavens. There probably is still a layer of water or ice above the stars. We don't know. Nobody knows what's nobody knows where the last star is. And if you can find it, the next question is, <clears throat> what's next? Okay. But the Bible says the earth was standing out of the water and in the water. It says the scoffers in the last days would be willingly ignorant of what that creation was like. I take the position that the earth was protected by a crystalline canopy, probably a couple inches of ice, maybe 10 miles up, that increased the air pressure, that filtered out the sunlight, stopped most of the UV light, and allowed the people to live to be 900 or more. Number three, animals living during this time would also live longer and grow much bigger. Some animals are what we call indeterminate growers. They never stop growing. People stop growing at 16 or 18 today. Probably be different before the flood because they didn't get married and have kids until they're 100. So I think there was a crystalline canopy above that made them live longer. The Bible says, or the book of Josephus, written about the time of Christ, also says there was he set the heaven above the firm, above the universe, surrounding it with ice. They believe there used to be a crystalline canopy above the atmosphere. I agree. That's what was taught 2,000 years ago. I think that's what the Bible teaches. The Jews have always taught this crystalline canopy was three fingers thick, or some said two fingers thick. I'm sure they argued about that. But anyway, a couple inch thick layer of ice above the atmosphere, which was a flat and solid surface of ice, increasing air pressure. And we, you can watch my video, too, for what the Jews have always taught about that topic. They want to get to one other thing here. Number five, the Earth's atmosphere had even greater oxygen concentration in the past than it does today. When they find air bubbles in amber, like Jurassic Park, you know, get the mosquito blood out, the air bubbles in amber have 32% oxygen. The air we're breathing today is 21% oxygen. Evidence shows they used to have greater oxygen concentration which would be one factor in making them live longer, and I think getting them to grow much bigger. The only trend in recent literature is suggestion of far more oxygen in the early atmosphere. Now, the evolutionists teach it was a reducing atmosphere with no oxygen because they know the problem oxygen causes for trying to get life to evolve from, from nothing. What a dumb theory that is. Anyway, the, under hyperbaric pressure, high pressure, and increased oxygen, your plasma would be oxygen saturated in addition, to, in addition to the hemoglobin, and you'd be able to run for hundreds of miles and live much longer. Very different world back then. Number six, some animals never stop growing like reptiles never stop. I think there's obvious evidence in the fossils of giant reptiles. We call them dinosaurs. I don't know if anybody argues about that. They did live, and they were huge. So if the reptiles are living to be lo living long enough to grow to be 60 feet long, I think the assumption would be something was different about the whole world, and probably people also were living to be much older and growing much bigger. There's clear evidence of giants living in the recorded history today. Robert Wadlow was almost nine feet tall from Alton, Illinois. There's Robert with a size 37 shoe standing between his brother and his father. So certainly some giant people have been around. Goliath was six cubits in a span, according to the Bible. That would be about nine feet tall, maybe 10 feet tall. Here's me by a statue of Robert Wadlow in St. Louis, Illinois, in Alton, Illinois, uh, almost nine feet tall. Number five, and number eight, there are scores of legends about giants in the past. In an Italian coal mine, they said they discovered a giant skeleton of a man 11 feet six inches tall from the coal mine. Let's put him on your basketball team. Uh, let's see. Uh, here. Here's a guy in Russia who died here last year. 
He was eight foot four and still growing. Leonard Stadnik, a friend of mine, went over to see him. He was eight foot seven when he finally died. He never stopped growing. Here he is trying to use a cell phone. That's going to be a challenge, I think, Leonard. Uh, Roman Emperor Maximus, according to the legends, was eight feet six inches tall. I think anybody would consider that a giant. That was during historic times, during the Roman Empire. <clears throat> a skeleton nine feet eight inch tall was found in Indiana in 1879, at least it was reported. Now, what happened to it? Where is it? Can't prove it. I'm just putting out the fact that there is historical evidence, anecdotal evidence, of giants living on the earth. In Virginia City, Nevada, there was a small private museum where he saw two skeletons about nine feet tall. I interviewed Charles Hankley about this. The owner had found him in a cave. About 10 years later, he stopped to see the skeletons, but the owner told him someone from the government had taken them and would not return them. I think I know why. See, some people want you to believe that we started off small like a chimpanzee and man's getting bigger, better, stronger, smarter. And if the evidence were to show man used to be bigger, they would completely counter the crazy, crazy evolution theory, which is essential for a lot of other things. We'll get into that some other day. So huge bones were found in Louisiana <clears throat> in 1902, indicating the guy was nine feet tall. This is from the Daily Town Talk in 1902 in Louisiana. A skeleton was found in uh, nearly 10 feet tall in Humboldt Lake, Nevada, according to Lovelock Review, the Miner's Journal, back in 1931. In Guam, <clears throat> there are legends of giants that used to live there that built the latte stones. Who on earth is carving these things? So my, my one bit of my evidence would be there is historical evidence, reports of giants. Walkertown, Indiana, a group of amateur archaeologists opened up a mound in 1925 and found eight giants ranging from eight to nine feet long wearing heavy copper armor. Through the bungling of the diggers and the disinterest of the museum establishment, the discoveries were scattered and lost. Now, hold it. Why would a museum not be interested in nine-foot skeletons? Because it goes against the evolution theory. Tom, you're the philosopher. Think about it. Why would they defend that theory at all cost? In 1616, Dutch explorers reported stumbling upon a pair of skeletons more than nine feet tall. That's why the whole region down there is named Patagonia, which means big feet. Southern South America is called Patagonia. Skeleton 12 feet tall was found by soldiers in Lompoc Rancho, California, 1883, according to the book The Unexplained by Carl Schuker. Uh, and the Indians got upset because they had disturbed a grave, and so they reburied the skeleton. Skeleton 12 feet tall reported by many newspapers in Tucson, Arizona in 1891. The man had six toes, long hair, and a bird-shaped headdress. There's a book called A Scientific American back in 18... Um, I forget, I don't have the date on this, I apologize. 1877, gold miners reported finding a skeleton for uh, what the owner would have been 12 feet tall, just based on the length of the femur from heel to uh, knee. Two other, a male and female skeleton, were nine foot four and eight foot tall. Others 10 feet tall were reported. I talked to Joe Taylor today, and he said there is an enormous amount of evidence of giant people, 8, 10, 12 feet tall, maybe. A woman reputedly seven feet tall was found with an infant. Joe Taylor, uh, mountblanco.com is his website in northern Texas, M-T-B-L-A-N-C-O. A skull almost twice the size of a normal human was reported in, here in, in Joe's magazine, mountblanco.com. Um, this is from uh, Discovery and Conquest of Mexico and New Spain by Bernal Diaz de Castillo. He said, our friends told us when they came to this country and they had settled themselves there, how it came that notwithstanding their vicinity to the Mexicans, they resembled each other so little and lived in perpetual warfare with each other. The tradition was also handed down from their forefathers that in ancient times there lived a race of men and women who were of immense stature with heavy bones and were very bad and evil disposed people, whom they had for the greater part exterminated by continual war and the few that were left gradually died away. Discovery and conquest of Mexico, they said, uh, they dragged forth a bone, or rather a thigh bone, of one of the giants. It was very strong and measured the length of a man of good stature. This bone was still entire from the knee to the hip joint. So on my video number two of my series, Creation Seminar, I cover all the evidence that I've been able to find of historical anecdotal evidence of giant people. See, 
I don't have a reason to doubt this kind of stuff. Uh, it seems reasonable if a lot of people are reporting this. I mean, eyewitness testimony counts for something in a trial. If you have 10 people that said, I saw George walking down the street with a red shirt, I bet George is walking down the street with a red shirt. That's plenty of 10 people eyewitness accounts. We have hundreds of, of claim, supposedly eyewitness accounts, the people who claim they saw giants or giant skeletons. Here's the mummified head of an Inca king who would have been about nine and a half feet tall, the Inca civilization in uh, South America. Um, you have that book right there in your hand. Didn't you a minute ago, Tom, the giant book? Is that uh, this book, uh, Giants? I don't know. There it is. Yeah. There's lots of evidence about this. New York Giants, 1871, archaeological dig, uh, reported a skeleton, 200 giant skeletons, nine feet tall. Giant footprints were found in South, America, South Africa. All you got to do is Google where there are giants on the earth, and you'll find people arguing both sides, like I'm sure Tom's going to take the other side. But uh, there's a lot of historical evidence that there were giants. And I'm going to run out of time, so I'll go through this quickly here. Uh, plenty of stuff on giants. Let me get up to my other reasons. Uh, in Mandan, near Bismarck, North Dakota, they reported the Manegui were thought to have come before they joined the Lenny in the region of Mississippi. Let's see. Uh, let me skip all that. From This is from Scientific American in 1883, before they became dedicated to defending the evolution religion. There was a cemetery of fully 100 acres filled with bones of a giant race. This vast city of the dead lies just east of Fort Lincoln Road. The ground has the appearance of being filled with trenches piled full of dead bodies. There's evidently been a grand battlefield where thousands of men have fallen. You can read Scientific American 1883. So I'll skip up here, but, but the historical evidence, I think, is pretty overwhelming that there were giants. Here's a copper axe head that weighs 39 pounds. Swing that for five minutes. Here's a stone axe head, 27 pounds. Guy brought it to my museum when I was in Pensacola, Florida. So the Smithsonian used to report gigantic dinosaurs, gigantic humans, but they stopped. They're now dedicated to defending the evolution religion. Lovelock Cave, Nevada was the story of a giant skull found. There's a normal human thumb bone next to a regular giant human thumb bone. Uh, let's see. Uh, there's a replica we have in our museum, reportedly 47 inches long, of a femur thigh bone. The guy would have been about 13 feet tall minimum. Uh, again, all I have is a replica of the bone. So these are giant jaw bones in uh, Turkey, eastern Turkey. Uh, average human today could put their head inside and rattle it back and forth inside that jawbone. There were giants in the earth, according to uh, the mound in uh, uh, northeast Wisconsin. I went up there to talk to the people that had the property. They had built a dam and made a lake and flooded it. You could barely see the top. There's a little island in the middle of a lake. They said that's where it was found, right out there, the giant bones. Okay, so the Bible says there were giants in the earth in those days. Genesis clearly says there were giants. Tom? If you want to call the Bible a lie, you're welcome to do that. But I want you to be clear. You are saying God is lying, or at least Genesis is lying. Jesus quoted Genesis 25 times. He believed in Genesis. I'll stick with Genesis. I'll stick with the Bible. And I think Genesis, neither Genesis nor Jesus have ever been proven wrong. You're asserting the Bible is wrong. I think the burden of proof is on you. Evolution theory says man used to be smaller. He's getting bigger. This is absolute baloney. But if you need to protect this for some other reason, like that's maybe your paycheck, you go ahead. But I think that theory is devoid of any scientific explanation or uh, evidence. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much from Kent Hoven. And we will now switch it over to T-Jump. So it's actually, I, I lost track of the time. So I wanted to, just to be safe to make sure that I didn't cut uh, either side short. Well, instead of giving you 12, we'll give you 13 minutes. So uh, to match that, from the first one. Tom, you have 13 minutes and the floor is all yours. Thanks for being here. All right. Uh, thanks uh, for having me. I always appreciate it. Thanks for Kent for coming on. I really appreciate him taking the time to have a third debate. Uh, check out our other debates, by the way. They're good debates. We had a pleasant conversation both times. So the debate tonight is about did giants of the Old Testament exist? And the way we assess this claim is the same way we assess any other claims. Like, did unicorns exist? Did leprechauns exist? Did dinosaurs exist? Did the elves and dwarves and Lord of the Rings exist? If you claim something exists now or in the past, the first thing you need to do is to show the thing that you've asserted to exist is more than just something in your imagination. You have to show it exists and isn't imaginary. We humans have a tendency to make up lots of things that are imaginary, non-existing things. So anything that is asserted to exist is imaginary until demonstrated otherwise. You have to provide evidence that whatever you're asserting isn't an imaginary thing. 
So the first thing Kit needs to do is tell us what a giant is and how it differs from a tall human. The tallest human we have on record as presented by Kit was Robert Waldro, or Waldlow, who's eight feet, 11 inches. Is he of this race of giants mentioned in the Bible? Is he a biblical giant or is he just a tall human? What's the difference? If you don't have a way to tell the difference between a tall human and an actual giant from mentioned in the Bible, then there isn't really any evidence of giants because the evidence of tall skeletons could just be tall humans in the past that aren't giants at all, not have nothing to do with the Bible. So is it is this tall skeleton a giant from the Bible or is it just a tall human? And if all it means to be a giant is that just it's a tall human and that's it, and that's just what it qualifies to be a giant, then apparently Robert qualifies as being a biblical giant. Okay, I'm happy if that's if that's it, but that doesn't that is not evidence of the biblical giants because it, like there's this condition called Stahl's ear syndrome, where is a syndrome where you have pointy ears, and the fact that there are lots of examples throughout history of people with pointy ears, isn't evidence that there's a race of elves that was mentioned in Lord of the Rings that actually existed. The fact that people are tall or people have pointy ears isn't evidence of a specific race as mentioned in a specific book. You have to have a little bit more than that. Dwarfism is a condition where people are very short. And we have lots and lots of evidence throughout history and skeletons of very short people. Is that evidence of the dwarves that were mentioned in Lord of the Rings? No, it's just evidence that there were short people. In order to show that, the, that there is a specific race as mentioned in a specific book that exists, you need some way to differentiate that from just the other known things that we already have lots of examples from. So if you want to claim that there are biblical giants exist, you need to provide a way to differentiate tall humans from biblical giants. Or is that all they are? It's just tall humans. Uh, after we establish whether this difference exists or what this difference is, we need to show that this difference is a real existing thing and not an imaginary thing. That's what evidence is. Evidence is just anything that can be used to differentiate to show something is real and not imaginary. So what does this evidence need to look like? Well, there are infinitely many ways to explain anything. Any phenomenon, any event, occurrence, observation, et cetera, has infinitely many ways it can equally reasonably be explained. This is known as the problem of underdetermination in science. For example, suppose we see a cup fall over. What could have caused this to happen? Maybe it was the wind knocked it over or somebody bumped the table it was sitting on. Maybe it was caused by a mouse or a squirrel or a bird. It could have been caused by a meteorite falling from the sky or invisible aliens. Someone may have used psychic powers to knock it over or magic or mayhap it was a ghost or a fairy or a leprechaun or a god. Maybe the entire world was just created five minutes ago and the cup was already lying on its side. Maybe the world's created six minutes ago or seven. We can come up with infinitely many ways to explain the current and the cups falling over. Just add infinite, just keep going forever and ever to come up with different ways to explain it. But how do we show which of these infinitely many explanations is the best explanation? Well, we know that all of them except for the one truth is imaginary, it's just made up. So there needs to be some criteria we can use to differentiate between imaginary explanations and the real one. One approach is to take all of the past and present observations, everything we know about the event, and see which explanations can explain all of the past and present data. However, we know this approach doesn't work because all of them can all explain all of the past and present data using ad hoc reasoning. For example, let's suppose that we saw mouse droppings around the cup when we looked at it. If my explanation was that a mouse knocked over the cup, I could of course argue clearly the evidence indicates my explanation. However, if I, if I have a different explanation that it wasn't a mouse, well, I can say, well, the fact that we see mouse droppings around the cup isn't indicative of a mouse because the mouse just put the droppings there and left without knocking over the cup. And it was actually something else that knocked over the cup. So even if your explanation is something other than a mouse, you can still explain the mouse droppings around the cup. Any possible observation can be explained by a different phenomenon, as long as your explanation is not a mouse. Or if it's a mouse, you can just say the mouse explains the mouse droppings. Any explanation can always explain all of the past and present data. So in order to show something that is actually evidence, what we need to do is make future predictions. The one thing that makes an explanation better than all the others is if you can say, if my explanation is correct, I can project into the future something we don't know yet. And if that's true, then we have reason to believe that that explanation isn't imaginary, that it's describing something in the world. Therefore, evidence of an explanation is real only if you can say, given my explanation, I can predict something that, that we will discover in the future that we don't know yet that the other explanations don't anticipate and will only be able to explain ad hoc or post hoc. And we can use this metric to differentiate between explanations of things that are imaginary and what is real. So if the explanation can predict things in the world that we don't know yet, it's reasonable to believe that explanation is true and not just one of the imaginary ones. Now, it can't just be any predictions. I can't just predict anything. Like I can predict the sun will come up tomorrow, but that's not, that's, that can be used by any of the explanations. So that isn't good enough we need to make certain kinds of predictions. For example, I could predict that I could make a prediction that was verified by me and my friends in my backyard. Unfortunately, you weren't there, so you can't reproduce, repeat the experiment to verify it for yourself. 
I mean, obviously this doesn't work because anyone could make that kind of a claim and say they had a private experiment that was verified by themselves. So whatever this prediction is that you make, it has to be repeatable to count as evidence. Also, I can make the prediction that there is a man named Bob somewhere in that direction. And if you look in the specified direction, you don't see Bob. I can just simply say, well, well he's out of sight. You got to go further. And you can keep looking and you still don't see him. Like, well, no, no, you got to keep going farther, keep going farther. And I can repeat this line ad infinitum, no matter how far you go without finding Bob, and still say, well, it's, it's a prediction. And so my, my thing is still true. So that, uh, that kind of prediction also doesn't work, which means the predictions need to be falsifiable. Also, I can make a prediction that if my explanation is correct, the sun will rise tomorrow. Again, this line of reasoning isn't very reasonable because anyone can predict it because it's something we already know. So in order for it to be a, a valid evidence, you have to predict something new, something we don't know yet, something novel. Also, I can make the prediction that exactly one billion light years from here is a teapot floating in space. Again, this is not a valid piece of evidence because anyone can make predictions that we can't verify. So your predictions have to be verifiable. You have to be able to show that they're actually right. Also, I can make numerous predictions at random. I can just predict the next lottery number will be blah, blah, blah. I just predict every single number. I mean, eventually I'm going to get the number right. That also isn't evidence because it has to be a specific. Anyone can just make a bunch of random guesses and eventually one will be right. So you have to be able to make precise predictions that are consistently correct, which is why prophecies and parables and narratives and symbolism are not evidence because they're just like making millions and millions of predictions because they can be interpreted in millions and millions of ways. So we need very precise predictions. And finally, even if I'm able to make precise predictions that are novel, testable, verifiable, falsifiable, I may be using an explanation different from the one I've accredited. Therefore, in order for it to be evidence, other people have to be able to use the same methodology I've described to be able to make other predictions. This is called being confirmed by peer review. Peer review doesn't simply mean it's confirming the same test by other people. It means other people can use the same methodology to make other predictions. So. Uh, in order, in conclusion, the predictions an explanation must make in order for it to qualify as evidence is it has to be repeatable, falsifiable, novel, verifiable, precise predictions that are confirmed by peer review. And this does not just apply to fallen cups, but to anything and everything, the origin of the universe, the origin of life, the diversity of species, the apparent fine tuning of the universe, any and all unexplained events, the giants in the past, everything have to be able to make novel, testable predictions before we can actually say there's any evidence that they are not imaginary things. So. What do we need in order to show giants in the Bible existed? One, we need a definition of a giant. Two, we need what how the difference is between giants in the, from the Bible and just tall humans. And three, we need predictions that this explanation can make that are repeatable, falsifiable, novel, verifiable, precise predictions that are confirmed by peer review. Do we have any of this? Did, present, did Kent present any of this? No. All he did was present a bunch of myths and stories and legends and a couple of bones. None of, none of that's evidence that the giants from the Bible existed. It might be evidence that tall humans existed. I know I definitely grant that uh, uh, Robert, the eight foot, 11 foot guy existed. A lot of the examples he presented, I, I don't think are false or obviously false. And so it's, so it's true that all of the evidence presented by creationism is rejected by science and the Smithsonian and all accredited scientific institutions, but it's not because they're suppressing the creationist data or trying to hide it. It's because it just doesn't qualify as evidence from the definition I gave above. The creationist explanations don't provide any way to differentiate themselves from just another imaginary things that we can make up. And so it's not that the science is suppressing creationism, it's just creationism just isn't as good as the other explanations we have. Uh, science is a competition of ideas. Every scientist has their own ideas which they want to be right. So every scientist is trying to dismantle the ideas of every other scientist and anybody else who comes up with ideas to explain reality. And so it's not that creationism is uh, like being rejected by science because scientists are biased against it, is that creationism is just a bad explanation. It just doesn't work to explain the data as well as the other things that we have. Um, uh, Kent mentioned that evolution, that apparently somehow evolution says man is getting bigger. Well, that's, that's not the case. Um, evolution doesn't say that at all. Evolution, in many cases in evolution, things get smaller in order to get faster or more efficient. Like evolution has nothing to do with man getting, not getting bigger. So if there were bigger humans in the past, there's no reason for evolutionists to hide that at all because it's not in any way in contradictory with evolution. So I don't understand why he thinks that that would in any way be contradictory to evolution or that scientists would have any reason to hide big a, big humans. I mean, we already know big humans. I don't know, I don't know why he thinks they would hide that. Um, the axes he mentioned, he had these pictures of axes. Well, those weren't axes that you'd put on the end of a piece of wood and swing. Those are axes you pick up and drop. So yeah, they're gonna be heavier and that's not really a problem because you don't swing them, you, you drop them. 
So I don't I don't understand why he thinks that that's evidence of giants at all. Um, you mentioned eyewitness accounts. Eyewitness accounts aren't evidence of anything that doesn't have an empirical basis. In a court of law, eyewitness accounts do not ever count as evidence of miracles or magic, or mythical creatures, the paranormal, supernatural, UFOs, doesn't count as evidence. Like if you said someone that uh, uh, saw someone wave a magic wand and a, a green light came out and killed the other guy, and someone had an eyewitness testimony of this, and you went into a courtroom and said, I saw this guy kill this guy with magic, it would immediately be thrown out of court. Doesn't matter if you have an eyewitness testimony because eyewitness testimonies don't count for things that don't have an empirical basis. So eyewitness testimonies do not count as evidence for things like mythical creatures like giants. Um, I think that covers it. I think I'm good. Well, thank you very much, Tom. We will now go into the open discussion forum. So we are very excited for this. Gentlemen, uh, we will, I guess, we'll let Kent uh, get the ball rolling and then, you know, just kind of let it go from there. So thanks for being here again, guys. Uh, <clears throat> yes, sir. Tom, you said several interesting things. I, I'm sorry, you read several interesting things. Uh, let me get to uh, some thoughts here. Um, you said you have to claim it. If you claim it, then you have to prove it. I wish you'd keep, take, keep, keep that same standard when it comes to evolution. They claim that all the different animals came from a common ancestor of an amoeba. Uh, do you yep. do, do you hold them to that same standard? Yep, absolutely. Every single one of those predictions can be held up to the criteria that I presented in my introduction. Those are all verified by, can make novel, testable, verifiable, falsifiable, precise the, predictions that can be- These are all confirmed. verified, okay. Would you please tell me where anybody has found a 95% fish or a 98% fish or a 20% fish? All we find are fish produce fish. There are no examples, right. no examples of any animal ever producing anything other than its kind. This is there's not no scientifically examples. verifiable. Well, there's no examples in evolution where they ever say that it's not going to happen. So evolution would say, yeah, that's that's correct. You would never find a 20% okay. that's not, this, that's not text, this textbook shows mammals and lobsters and spiders and worms coming from a protozoa. Mm -hmm. Did the pro was was the protozoa a worm or a spider or a human? Did it turn into something other than its kind? No, all the things above it are still kinds of protozoa. So it's not that protozoa are transformed into something else. Oh, it's that say that again. Are Humans are still a type of protozoa? We're made of the same kind of stuff. So it was actually, we'd be eukaryotes would be the correct terminology. And you're a philosopher. Protozoa. Okay. Do you believe eukaryote? Do you believe this textbook, which shows animals and fungi and plants have a common ancestor? Do, do you believe that? Yes. I know, I'm sure you do. How about this? All the different birds and animals in the world have a common ancestor. Inside that circle is religion. Now you're claiming Wait, what? that hey, what if someone inside? makes a claim, they have to prove it. I'd like you to Wait. show me where any animal in the laboratory under some, a human observation, has anybody ever observed any plant or animal produce anything that would be recognized as a different kind? Has any farmer ever seen a cow produce a non-cow or a dog produce a non-dog? Is there any evidence for this? No, evolution doesn't say it would, so I don't know why you even say that. Evolution doesn't say that happens. Evolution says a cow and an amoeba have a common ancestor. I mean, the, I just showed you yeah. the charts. The books are full of this kind of stuff. Yes. Was this common ancestor ever... a cow? Was this a cow or an amoeba? It was an amoeba. Did it turn into a cow? Uh, no, it had children, and the children changed slowly over time. So over millions of years, it turned into a cow. Well, it died and it had kids that were differences and the right, differences. Right. Okay. So it's the, the descendants slowly turned from an amoeba to a cow. Yes. And, still and you, think that is, you think that is science? Native amoeba. Yes, because that makes Here, testable. Okay, I'm sure you do. Prediction. Okay. Here we have a book we claiming that, clearly. Yes. Remember, remember in my introduction, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. So in my introduction, I said that in order to claim that one explanation is a good explanation, you have to use it to make novel, testable, verifiable predictions. Well, we can do that with evolution. So we can actually show that it's not imaginary. One sec. We just okay. want to, just to, gentlemen, so sorry to jump in, just to see if we can try to either explain the context and how it draws or ties back to the giants issue, or if we can move back yeah, I, in that yeah. direction. Well, yeah. yeah. Uh, Tom took the, took the attack that the Bible clearly teaches there were giants in the earth in those days, but he says that's not true. 
because if you're going to make a claim, you have to verify it. I'm simply asking, where does he take this same approach when it comes to religions like evolution that says humans and birds have a common ancestor with crocodiles? Uh, that is what the books teach. Holt Biology sitting right here, or Heath Biology sitting on the shelf. So um, I, I, don't th I think he's got a double standard here. Uh, there's, there's no evidence of any animal ever producing anything other than its kind. And there is plenty of anecdotal evidence of giant humans living. You're right. We shouldn't really define what giant means. I mean, most people, Andre the Giant, how big was he? Eight foot four? You know, anything over seven foot is considered gigantic today in today's standard. But my point is, the evolution theory teaches man was small like a chimpanzee, and he's getting bigger. I think certainly the historical and anecdotal evidence is just exactly the opposite. We are a degenerate race. We live only 70, 80 years now as opposed to 900. So I think things have gone backwards. But I'm just concerned that he's got a double standard. Are turtles and bobcats related? Well, yeah, I already answered that. Yes, I hold evolution oh, to yeah, the exact okay. same yeah, standard. They are. So in my introduction, as I said, ev everything right. that evolution claims is verifiable in that prediction. So it does make predictions. So evolution predicts that if we give it enough time, uh, let's see, uh, a reptile will turn to a bird or a human. No, that's not a prediction. A prediction is something we don't know that has been verified. So do you think the fossil evidence shows that humans and birds have a common ancestor, which was a reptile? Yes. The kids are being taught that. Yes, that, that we can show. We have testable, verifiable predictions. to. So to you can show that. that a reptile turned into a bird or a crocodile or a human? Yes, that's what the predictions do. That's why they're there. Okay, that's and would you, show, would you show that by using fossils? Is that, would be, that be the, how else could you show such a thing? We would show it using novel, testable, verifiable predictions. And I, I'm sure you're aware that my argument's very simple. No fossil counts as evidence in the evolution theory. I didn't, I didn't None of say them. anything about fossils. I said predictions. I mean, we make predictions. We don't show that fossils do it. We show prediction. Like, okay. if my theory is true, here's a consequence I can predict. And if that consequence is correctly okay, verified... So if, one second, going to one sec. If I, so sorry, guys. Just to, uh, Unless it's like more related to giants it would be in an ideal world just because i don't want to get accused of clickbait so if people I are see. okay yeah well i know full well that tom really wants to defend the evolution theory and he's looking for anything to call the call the bible wrong the bible clearly says there were giants in the earth he doesn't want to believe that and the only alternative i'm aware of is evolution which i'm sure he believes in so it's not clickbait from my perspective i know what the real target of all this debate is is to try to say the Bible's wrong, therefore evolution's true. He has well, not no, no, proven not exactly. that there were not giants. How would you prove such a thing? Would you well, prove again, to me I, there were never giants in the earth? How could you prove that? Well, again, I don't actually, even if there are giants, that doesn't contradict anything in my worldview. So I don't have any problem if there are giants. I just don't see any reason to believe that there were. Like, So I, I don't have any problem with giants. Like, All right, I just, and I don't see any reason to believe that uh, any animal in the past was able to produce something other than its kind. I think amoeba are still producing Neither amoeba I. today. I, I agree. So that, but that has nothing to do with my argument. So again, my argument is just that you're claiming that giants existed. I don't see any reason to believe giants existed. Like I don't have any problem okay. with giants. If giants existed, that's totally fine. But I don't see any reason to believe they did exist. They're just well, tall. Would you agree that? Would you agree that the Bible does say there were giants in the earth? Yes, or definitely. Okay. I don't know if they actually used. I don't think it uses the word giants. But I right, sure. Genesis I'm chapter okay with six. Genesis chapter 6, slide number 360, 163, uh, Alt DV, 163. You can look it up in your Bible. There were giants in the earth in those days. Would you agree that the Bible says there were giants in the earth in those days? No, I mean like the original Hebrew and Greek and what the way the words interpret to. I don't know if it actually means giants in the way that we interpret it, but that's not really okay. relevant. Like I can grant it says giants. I'm, I'm okay to have I'm happy to grant it. I, I don't need the Hebrew or Greek. I can read English pretty well, and it says giants. Now, Jesus quoted Genesis 25 times. I didn't call the references up, but I could find them. Would you just simply agree, for sake of argument, that Jesus did quote Genesis 25 times? Sure. Okay. Do you believe Jesus was lying or stupid or wrong? Or what's your, are, are you calling him a liar? I believe Genesis was wrong. I, I think Jesus accurately quoted Genesis. I just think Genesis is wrong. You think, do you think the author of Genesis was lying that there were not giants in the earth? Would uh, you agree? I showed historical 
references, anecdotal references to people living to be a really old, the golden age. What do you think the golden age was? Why did so many cultures talk about man used to live to be a thousand? Are they all lying? And Tom Jump's the only one who's right? No, I'd say science is the one that's right because we can show science with novel, testable, verifiable predictions. People always make up stuff. Like all stories, there are many people who talk about all different kinds of gods. Do you think that all the gods right, right. exist or are they just lying? Well, people can make up all kinds of stories. They can make up stories that we all came from an amoeba. Evolution is nothing but a story. It's a religious view. There's no evidence of that. No, actually, there is. That's, that's the prediction. There is evidence. Works, can you show me? Would you agree that an amoeba is a single-celled organism? Yes. Could you show me the scientific evidence for a two-celled organism, or three-celled, or four-celled? Since humans have 100 trillion cells, somewhere along the line, the amoeba would have to gain some cells. Would you show me the scientific yeah. evidence for these two-celled creatures? Where are they? Yes, I can. There's lots of evidence of that. But There's lots of evidence for two-celled creatures. Tom, you are completely yeah. mistaken. Or somebody lied to you, and you're repeating uh, their lie, or you're lying yourself. There's no so, evidence so, of any two-celled animal on the planet. When a, when a sperm and an egg cell join, it is then a two-celled single animal. It's two cells. No, it's animal. a one-celled creature. The, no, the two, egg absorbs the DNA from the sperm, and it's a single cell. Now it splits into then, two, then, three, four, ah, ten, twenty. There you, go. there you go. There you go. So so it splits into two. So now it has two cells. And then it's a two cell is, is that a, are you, oh, I'm, is that a two celled organism that can live on its own and is reproducing and fully developed? Or is that a stage of its development? That's a stage of development of a bigger and a multi celled animal, but it's not a two celled right. animal, Tom. Right. So that's all you need to have is to have the cell the single cell needs to start to multiply into multiple cells and they can continue to grow. It doesn't need to actually stay two celled for any reason. Well, there are single celled organisms that stay single celled all their life. There's that's sure. their adult stage, their single cell. Where is the sure. adult stage of a two cell creature? You don't need that for evolution. You just need it to multiply. You can just say if there's a single cell that has a genetic mutation that causes it to grow and start to get more more cells, that's all you need. You don't actually need a two celled organism. So you you do believe that man with a hundred trillion cells came from a single celled amoeba like creature, a, pair, a protozoa, and so somewhere along the line, the protozoa would have to produce something that is non protozoa, because two cell uh, a protozoa is not two celled. So where's the evidence for an animal producing something other than its kind? You said there's evidence. You're saying a human embryo a, in its growth stage is evidence that the protozoa became two-celled. Is that your evidence from a totally different life form? No, that's just evidence of things going from one cell to many cells. Like we, we have lots of evidence of things going from one cell to many cells. So there's, there's no problem there. But the evidence no. for evolution is all of its testable predictions again. But this again has nothing to do with giants. There's no evidence well, yeah. of giants. That... Yeah, okay, you're right. We're slightly off track. The Bible clearly says there were giants in the earth in those days. And Jesus quoted Genesis 25 times. And like I said, I'll stick with those two. Nothing has been proven wrong. Here's the difference, Tom. You're not getting a major point here. I believe by faith the Bible is true. Jesus is telling the truth. There were giants in the earth. But I'm not requiring everybody to teach that in the school system. I'm not forcing okay. everybody to pay for my religion to be taught. You guys want to believe that amoeba turned to elephants and humans and pine trees, and you want to force everybody to learn that at taxpayer expense. You want to put these charts in the textbooks and say, see, kids, this is science. A protozoa turned to a human. This is not science. This is your religion. I wish you take it out of the schools. It's got nothing to do with science. Go teach it in a private school to whoever wants to pay and come learn it. You can I, learn I don't lots of any... biology without getting I into don't... evolution at all. Evolution has nothing to do with science. Nothing. I don't run any schools, so I can't do anything about that. You're talking to the wrong guy here. So, But again, that has nothing to do with giants. So you said your evidence for giants is that Jesus said so and that Genesis said so. Well, I mean, Lord of the that's Rings so, says— That's two, Tom. That's two. I said there's, enormous, there's a lot of historical evidence. Certainly we have the testimony of Jesus believing Genesis. We have the testimony of Genesis claiming there were. We have the anecdotal evidence of, of people claiming they've seen these giant skeletons in the last 200 years. Was Scientific American lying in 1883 when they said all these giant skeletons were found? This is Scientific no, American. Like... That's a science peer-reviewed journal. Why did they publish articles about giants living in 1883? I'm sure they wouldn't today, just like you wouldn't find a peer-reviewed journal in North Korea claiming communism doesn't work. 
So the first case is where you said Jesus and Genesis say so. Well, Lord of the Rings says dwarves and elves exist, but I don't believe Lord of the Rings. So the fact that it says so in a book isn't evidence. You need something that's more but than hold that. I'm not, I'm not asking Lord of the Ring. I'm not defending Lord of the Ring. I'm defending the Bible. Oh, I don't the care what Lord of the Rings says. I, Lord of the Rings is actually better than the Bible, but it's a different topic. So then the next thing you said was anecdotal evidence. Well, anecdotal, anecdotal evidence isn't evidence of anything that doesn't have an empirical basis. Like if someone said aliens came down and abducted them in a courtroom, that's not going to be evidence. If someone says they were killed or they're, a unicorn killed their grandma in a courtroom, that's not evidence. It doesn't matter if it's eyewitness testimony or not. Eyewitness testimony isn't evidence unless it has an empirical basis. Unless you can scientifically verify it indirectly, eyewitness testimony doesn't count. And then you said that, um, what was it, the historical examples of um, – from the past, like I don't know about the science, the American example, the example you gave, what was it, uh, Scientific America or American Institute or something? But as far I as I know, there are. Re- yeah, I showed mm-hmm. all those references on screen. But uh, Tom, do you believe Abe Lincoln was president of the United States? Yes. Could you prove that without using written, without using some book? Uh, we have empirical evidence of people and. Presidents no, there's and, nobody alive today who knew Abe Lincoln. There's, there's no eyewitness yeah. testimony today. Nobody saw Abe Lincoln that's alive today that I'm aware of. You yeah, believe Abe that. Lincoln exists, well, and what's your evidence for Abe Lincoln? We have, we have empirical evidence of people and presidents and countries. Like All of those things have an empirical basis, so we don't actually all, need all eyewitness we have is, All we have is written records and books, though. You don't want to count that. No, no, no. I've we have a written record and a book. And we Science. also have evidence today. Like We can verify people exist today. We have people that are existing. We have countries that exist. We have presidents that exist today. Like all of that is empirically verifiable. So we can say that there was all of the stuff that we know exists today in the past. That's totally fine. But if you want to say there was a unicorn today that exists in the past and we can't verify any unicorns today, well, then that's not reasonable. So it's Boy, only- you're, off tra- you're trying to divert to a new, new topic here. I'm asking you the question, how would you prove Abe Lincoln existed and was president of the United States without right, using a book or a written record? Right. We use the empirical evidence of people existing today and say, and we infer that in the past and say people exist in the past. So it's a combination of the two. Okay. I have lots of I, for, uh, reported eyewitness accounts written in books by people who claim they found giant skeletons eight or nine or 10 feet tall. I showed you all the references. Smithsonian used to report them. Uh, miners review the miners have no reason to lie in a magazine. Let's see, like uh, History Channel reported it. Let's see. Uh, I, I showed all the references on screen, or you can get all my slides from our ministry here. But if they have a lot of people like they're digging in mines and they claim they found 10 or 12 feet skeletons and they write this report in a book, you want to reject that. But you would believe that somebody wrote a report that Abe Lincoln was president because there are presidents of countries today. What kind of logic is that? For heaven's sake, Tom, you're a philosopher. Think about that for five minutes. Yeah, like if, if we had a bunch of 12 feet people today, if there was like just every other person was 12 feet tall and, we, and someone said they saw a 12 foot person in the past, I'd be like, yeah, that's perfectly reasonable to accept. The reason we don't accept that is because we have no bones, no skeletons today that we can see that are of anyone except for like uh, Robert uh, Waldlow, of Wadlow. anyone being that height. So the fact that we don't have any of those skeletons means they're probably just made up by people. Made up stories, like unicorns, okay. like leprechaun. Well, here is, I don't know, a peer-reviewed journal, Scientific American. In July 1877, four prospectors looking for gold claimed they found giant skeletons. <clears throat> this is a photograph of the page from Scientific American, 1880, 1877. So <clears throat> right, but that's, not, that's not evidence of giants. That's evidence that some coal miners claimed they found giants. That's not evidence of giants. Ah, Okay. So where's the evidence of animals producing another kind of animal other than the same type of evidence here? Somebody claiming evidence. it happened. We can make Nobody's ever test- seen a dog we produce a non-dog. We can make future <laughs> testable predictions. We can say, if evolution is true, then we can make predictions in the future that we don't know yet and find out if those predictions are true. Right. And they are. I will make a, I'll make a prediction for the future right now. I'll go on record today, Kent Hoven, predicting. Take two dogs, <clears throat> let them produce offspring. Do that for 50 generations, 50 generations. I predict there will still be dog. Okay, but that's not a prediction prediction. because remember, remember in my, nope, 
Nope. Remember in my introduction, I gave a specific list of the things predictions have to be to qualify as evidence. Like I can predict the sun's going to come tomorrow and I can predict the sun's going to come tomorrow yeah. every day for 50 years. I would also not predict prediction. retroactively if we went back 50 generations, it was a dog. And if we went back 500 generations, it was a dog. Whether you want to go forward or back, it was dog. But you believe Again, in amoeba an turned to a dog. Tom, Again, that's not a prediction. A like, I can do the same thing with the sun. I can say we can retroactively go back 50 years and say every day the sun rose 50 years ago, therefore the spaghetti monster exists. That's not evidence of the spaghetti monster. That's not as all I, what I said. I if I said I believe the sun rose 50 years ago and the sun rose 500 years ago, I think I could go back. That'd be reasonable. But to say the sun rose five years ago, therefore spaghetti monster, who on earth? What kind of logic is that? Well, exactly. That's your argument. You're, you're making up my this argument. I said already... dogs produce dogs in the future. Dogs came from dogs in the past. There is no evidence of an amoeba <clears throat> becoming a dog. But you no, wish no, to believe never, it because human never, cells, when they first start to develop in the mother, you have two cells for a few minutes. I don't, I don't think you understood my point there. I so really understand. Go ahead. If you make a prediction of something we already know, anybody can make <clears> the same I can predict the sun's going to come up tomorrow. You can predict the sun to come up tomorrow. Someone who believes the spaghetti monster exists can believe the sun is going to come up tomorrow. Everyone can make that prediction. So it's not evidence of anything because everyone can make the same prediction. So everyone can predict dogs are going to come from dogs, just like everyone can predict the sun's going to come up tomorrow. Okay. That's not I'll evidence. Make another, I'll make another evidence. prediction. <clears throat> Sorry. Tom, I'm going to make another prediction right here, right now. Just, just one, just one second. May, if we method. find some culture out in the jungle, someplace that's never been civilized, civilized or, or contacted, if we could find a race of people <clears throat> in the jungle or uh, any place, if we could find cultures that have never been contacted by the outside world, all of a sudden we discover in the middle of some jungle, wow, here's a tribe of people. If you go in and learn their language, I bet they will have, I would predict they will have legends of people living to be to great age, and legends of people getting bigger. Why would a culture that is un, uncontacted, unpolluted by modern thinking, why, that's what's happened historically in the last 400 years. Many cultures have been contacted for the first time, and they have these legends of great age or great size or both. Why would they do that? Are they all lying? Uh, the same reason every culture throughout all human history has made up lots of stories of all kinds and like gods. For example, they all make up stories of gods. They all make up stories of ancestors. Well, they, they all they, they, Tom, Tom, of hold it. They all made up the same story of great age or great size. None of them made up the story of people flying or a spaghetti monster. Yes, they they had the same story. No, no, I they made up stories of people flying. They made up stories of people with elephants' heads. They made up stories with peoples of wings. They made up stories with, with massive turtles the size of planets. They made up all kinds of stories. That's the whole point is that you have to make a prediction of something we don't already know yet. But you just – that's like that's the exact same kind of prediction as saying the sun will rise tomorrow. We already know every human society makes up stories. So the fact that we're going to make up stories is pretty well known, just like the sun is going to come up is pretty well known. In order for it to be evidence, you have to predict something we don't know yet. Evolution can do that. We can predict right. exactly what fossils are going to be before we discover them and exactly what they're going to look like. We're going I'll to make a prediction of something you don't know yet. I predict okay. you are going to stand before God and give an account for every word you've ever spoken, every thought you ever thought. I predict there will be a judgment day for Tom Jump. That's a great prediction, but how do we test it? Uh, you, you, you'll test it yourself. It'll happen to you. Right, right but for it to be evidence for everyone in the audience, they're not going to know this. You, how, how do they test it? Forgive me. Well, it's like me saying the sun's going to come up in a thousand years. Or how, how's anybody going to test that? Exactly. That's why it's not evidence. Right. It has to okay. be verified. I'm just making a prediction. We'll see. We're going so to... back to the topic. My argument was the Bible says clearly there were giants. There's a lot of historical anecdotal evidence. I mean, lots of it, not just one or two sources. Hundreds of sources claim there were giants. I mean, let's, let's assume giant is anything 10 feet tall or more. There's a lot of historical people claiming they found them. And at the time, they were interviewed. They wrote them in peer-reviewed journals. But now the peer-reviewed journals do not like that story, so they wouldn't publish it. I bet the journals in North Korea 300 years ago taught things differently than the North Korean peer-reviewed journals teach today. I think things have changed in that country because of communism taking over. doesn't prove anything one way or the other. But your, your whole emphasis is on some peer-reviewed journal. I, I think there's some kind of people that are dedicated to teaching this evolution theory, and they know giants would go against that. Scientific American used to teach. August 14th, 1880, page 106, 
there were giants nine feet four inches tall. That's what they said in science, in Ohio. Why would they report this in Scientific American in 1880 on page 106? Were, do you believe Tom? Do you believe there was a giant nine feet four inches tall found in Ohio? Do you believe that story? Can, or uh, so sorry, Tom. I'll give you a chance to respond, but I just want to mention to everybody that we will go just in a few minutes to the Q and A. So sure. we'll give Tom a, a chance to respond, but just want to make sure that right. everybody knows. Thank you, Tom. Simple question: Do you believe they found a nine foot four inch skeleton in Ohio back in 1880? No, they thought they did, but it was disproven. They thought they did, but it was misprinted. Is that what you said? Disproven. They made a mistake. Like. Newton thought that F equals MA was an accurate description of reality, but then Einstein said, nope, that was actually wrong. So we've discovered new things that shows, nope, that wasn't the case. The so you can, just, you can just, hold it. I want to get this understood. You can just, somebody, somebody now, today in, in 2019, discovered that the 1880 skeleton was not nine foot four inches tall. How, how did they discover that? And why didn't, why didn't the people who found it report? Can't they, don't they have tape measures back then too? Uh, no, it's like people discover fossils and they think they're for one animal, then they discover, oh, nope, it's for a different animal. Like people discovered bones and thought they were for big humans, but really they were for a brontosaurus or a T Rex or a velociraptor or something bigger than humans. So well, what no, they did was. This one's, Tom, the Scientific American article clearly says they were found in a clay coffin, including the skeleton of a woman measuring eight feet. Within the coffin was found the skeleton of a child about three and a half feet length. The image that was that crumbled, and it crumbled when it exposed to the atmosphere. Another grave, they found the skeleton of a man and a woman. They're not finding just one bone, Tom. They're finding the whole skeleton. I can understand no, finding one bone and misinterpreting it. So, so what they is, did they was found they a coffin with a skeleton in it. No, they were just they wrong. So you can, this you is can wrong. find lots of bones. Yes. Oh. Remember, there are lots of, lots of cases of people putting together collections of bones and saying this collection of bones is one animal. And then you find out okay. it's not. It's a collection of bones of a whole bunch of different animals they put together into one amalgamation, which they call an animal, which actually isn't. Science makes mistakes all the time, <clears> and we correct right. them. That's how science works. Let me ask you a question, Tom. If you and I together went to Ohio, to this mound, which is in Br Brush Creek Township, Ohio, suppose you and I together opened a brand new mound that has never been touched before, and we found a nine-and-a-half-foot skeleton all intact in a, in a burial mound if you and i could find one today together with 50 witnesses and cameras watching on watching would you believe it yeah you absolutely would. yeah okay. I, mean, I have no problem with giants I, I, there's no there's no problem with giants I'm not, I'm not, if giants existed that would be cool i, I have no problem wow. with that yay so, I mean, so just, the scientist the, the scientists who verified this and published it in a peer-reviewed journal in 1880 it does not count for, as evidence for you the top topic of the debate is where's the evidence of giants? I think that's good evidence for giants. When scientific, yes, if, I, if, I, if Scientific American in 1860 said Abe Lincoln is running for president, I, I'd believe that. And I believe right, this one too. That's not, a, that's not a claim of something that uh, doesn't have an empirical basis. So in that claim, there's lots of claims in science where people have been proven wrong in the future. And then we go back and say, okay, so this claim was wrong. That's what happened in that case. We've, we've shown things that scientists made in the past. They were wrong. Would you please then, like, tell me just, tell me where you, you're saying this was proven wrong? Where's your evidence for that, Tom? Where's the evidence this claim was proven wrong? If you give me the link, I can find it in about five seconds. Okay. Scientific American, August 14th, 1880, page 106. How on earth did somebody say? prove that wrong 130 uh, years later, 140 years later? It was probably proven wrong like about five years later or less. Okay. I and mean, we just, no one else referenced it. So you don't like wrong. the idea of there being giants. If you, if you, no, don't really okay if, that. if I could convince you there were giants in the earth, like the Bible says, would that affect your uh, belief in evolution? No. There's no, there's no okay. problem with that. Remember, there, there are bigger you. monkeys than humans. So, like, there are orangutans that were bigger sure. than humans were millions of years ago. So there's you, no problem you, with giant big animals. Well, do you agree that giant fossils, fossils of giant animals like the giant sloth, 18 feet tall, have those been found? Were they really a giant sloth, 18 feet tall? I think so, yeah. 
I don't know okay. exactly in that case. But How yeah, about giant like, grasshoppers two feet long that have been found fossilized? Would you agree that grasshoppers got two feet long well, because they find fossils of them? Sure. How about centipedes eight feet long? Do you believe giant centipedes lived on the planet eight feet long? Sure. Do you believe giant uh, uh, dragonflies 50 inch wingspan? Sure. But you don't believe giant humans? What was, making, I don't see any fossils. what was making these insects giant and would what, what why couldn't it affect other things well the reason i believe in all of those things is because we actually have the fossils that are actually that big and we can take a tape measure and go yep that's one of those animals but we don't have any okay. fossils of humans that big forgive me i i think we should uh if we just have a last if uh if you guys have a final question you can otherwise it now might be a good time just to swing over into the q a if that's okay with you guys i'm fine with that Okay. I'm ready to go to Q&A. Thanks so much, guys. And we are going to, ladies and gentlemen, we totally appreciate your questions. Uh, we are thrilled to ask them. Want to let you know I'm sorry in advance. We probably won't get through all of them. We want to fly through as many as we can. But we just want to respect the debater's time because I should be doing a better job of keeping my promises. As sometimes we've gone over their time and they've been extremely gracious about it. So Maynard says, thanks for your super chat. They said, if Genesis 6-4 is literal, giants lived in the earth before and after. Men multiplied on the face of the earth. Two biblical distinctions. I think they're trying to say that. That I think they're trying to point out and argue for an inconsistency. I think this is for, for you, Kent. I don't think so. I think they're saying that that's because I asked at the beginning, what's the difference between a biblical giant and a tall human? And I think that those are giving examples of what the oh. difference between a biblical giant and a tall human would be. And so, yeah, those if we could like say that if giants existed independently from humans at some particular time frame and we could discover the fossils at one depth where the, the humans didn't exist and there's a big whole bunch of them. and They're all the same size. Then yeah, that would be evidence of giants. And I'd be happy to accept that. Sorry about that. Okay. Gotcha. Misunderstood it. Thanks for letting me know that. Mr. Archaeopteryx, uh, former opponent of Kent Hovind, uh, thanks for your super chat. He says, can name, can, I think he's maybe saying, can you name any non-biblical miracles recorded in, quote, history that don't support his beliefs that he still accepts? So I think he's saying, can Kent name any non-biblical miracles recorded in, quote, history that don't support his belief that namely christianity that makes as much sense as most of his comments on my youtube channel uh, <laughs> none uh <laughs> phrase it differently i'm not getting what he's I'm, asking there uh, I, I think he's i think he's asking that you're using a bunch of eyewitness testimonies to support the existence of uh giants and there are lots of eyewitness testimonies of miracles from other religions like hindus and uh, uh drama and all those kinds of things do you believe in those as having existed? Because they have the same kind of evidence as a uh, Christian. Uh, I believe there's a lot of eyewitness accounts of Abe Lincoln being president, though I've never met him. Um, I think all we have is eyewitness accounts of people who knew him and were, on, were, on, were in, in Congress with him. So there's, there's overwhelming eyewitness accounts that Abe Lincoln was president. And they were just talking 160 years ago. We're not talking thousands of years ago. And the further you go back, the fuzzier things get in history. Everybody knows that. But uh, can I um, give eyewitness account? No, I don't care what the Hindus believe or the Buddhists believe or anybody else believes. I'm not, I'm not asking everybody to pay for mine to be taught. You guys want to believe a rock and a hamster and a mosquito and a whale are related. I Next. resent paying for that to be taught. Next up. Thank you so much from each of you. And then we have Jesse Selbert. Thanks for your super chat. They asked, Kent, how does the square cube law fit into your model of giant humans in the past. <clears throat> According to the square cube law, it's not possible for a human to survive for long once they are taller than about eight feet. Well, I, I don't think this person understands what they're talking about here. Square cube law. Obviously, there are animals today that are taller than eight feet. Giraffes are way taller than eight feet. So how could a human survive at eight feet? I think there would be a limit there are certainly the, what uh, uh, surface area to volume ratio. I taught math for years, and we could argue about that if you like. But as an animal grows, you do get m more volume compared to the surface area. The surface area to volume ratio changes. Simple example, a cube that's one inch by one inch by one inch has one cubic inch of volume and six square inches of surface area. 
If you double it two by two by two, it now has eight cubic inches of volume and 24 square inches of surface area. Wait, we just went from six to one by doubling the size, or by eight, eight times the volume, it went down to three to one. So there is a surface area to volume ratio problem, which is why insects have a, have a hard time getting bigger because they depend on their surface area, their skin to breathe. Humans don't. So to find a giant six foot or eight foot centipede, which breathes through its skin is a real problem if you don't have greater air pressure or greater oxygen concentration or both. But we do find the skeletons of the, the fossils of these eight and a half foot centipedes. So from the Christian perspective, this is evidence that, wow, the Bible is right. The earth was different before the flood came and these fossils probably formed because of the flood. How many animals died today? Millions. How many turned to fossils? None. Fossils are not forming in any significant numbers and maybe even not at all today. And yet fossils are found in the ground by the, by the trillions. So I think there's, there certainly were fossils. As far as humans being limited in size, I don't know what that limit would be. In today's atmosphere, it might be a problem. If you would allow that there might have been, because of the giant insects, there might have been a different atmosphere, greater oxygen or greater air pressure, then that becomes less of a problem. People get 12 or 14 feet tall. There wouldn't be a limit. There certainly are animals today that are ginormous compared to humans, elephants, whales, they seem to do fine, giraffes, hippopotamus. So it, it's, I, I don't understand why, how this person thinks there's some kind of problem there. I think the Bible uh, would, be, uh, would be correct. It certainly hasn't been proven wrong on that topic. Gotcha. Yeah, actually, Kent gave some examples of uh, Robert Waldrow, who's actually over eight feet tall and he lived for a long time. So the fact people can live over eight feet can be over eight feet and live quite a long time, so that's not really a problem. Gotcha, thank you. Okay, hold on, let me finish. I went to St. Louis and preached at a church there. I met in Alton, Illinois, where Robert Wadlow grew up. I met two ladies that went to school with Robert Wadlow. They were his fellow students. He was seven foot four when he was in the Boy Scouts, world's tallest Boy Scout. They said Robert Wadlow was a very nice guy, wonderful guy. The kids teased him about being so tall all the time, but they were in school with him Perfectly normal kid. This great size did not affect his intelligence or his IQ or his demeanor. He was a nice, polite guy. He was a Christian, claimed he knew the Lord and was saved. He got to eight foot 11 and a quarter, and his knees began to cause problems because of rapid growth. I guess the cartilage pads didn't catch up with him in time or something. People who grow extra fast, extra large, do have certain problems, joint problems, but he was fine. He finally died, I think, about age 22 at eight foot 11 and a quarter. But uh, what, is, what are they claiming? What are you claiming, uh, Tom, was Robert's problem? Could he have gotten to 12 or 13 feet tall? In today's no, atmosphere, was, maybe not. Maybe not. But in the pre-flood atmosphere, yeah. I was, I was agreeing with you. There are people who can live for a long time over eight feet tall. I was agreeing with you. I wasn't, I wasn't challenging you on that one. Gotcha. Thank you very much. And next up, Brian... Let's see. We got that one. Robert Luscom. Thanks for your question. He says, someone please tell Mr. Hoven that it's not that animals change to other animals. What changes is the labels we give them once they've changed? <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Read that one again, James. He said, uh, someone please tell Mr. Hoven that it's not the a that animals change to other animals. What changes is the labels we give them once they've changed? What changes is the labels we give them once they change. Send that person back to school, please, okay? Get the next question. Next up, Brian G. Uh, asks, with just the right amount of cyanide in apricot seeds, you two can be confused on a plethora of topics. I think this is, sorry, that's a troll one that snuck in. Jim Majors, <laughs> thanks for your super chat, Jim Majors. He says, Kent, any evidence for giants that isn't anecdotal? Well, if you say anecdotal, I guess would that include the testimony of Genesis, which clearly says there were. We have the evidence of them living in the last hundred years where people saw them and lived with them, eight, nine feet tall. Robert Wadlow, almost nine. So what is the problem? Uh, the Russian guy just died a couple of years ago at eight foot seven, or would that be considered a giant? Uh, I'm six foot one, and I'm pretty big compared to most people. And so uh, eight foot's really big. Gotcha. So I guess I don't understand the problem. Now, what evidence do we have for Abe Lincoln besides anecdotal evidence? His bones. 
Next up. About uh, Nero. Do you believe Nero lived? Do we have his bones anywhere? Emperor Nero? Yeah. I don't think we have his bones, but we do have uh, archaeological evidence of the things he built. <clears throat> gotcha. So if we have archaeological evidence of things giants built, would you accept that as evidence of giants? There's certainly some awful big stuff out there. Sure. But as far as I know, I don't think those were built by giants. I don't think we need giants for that. Okay. Do gotcha. you think Nero himself built some of the Roman stuff, or did he have somebody else do it for him and take credit? Do you somebody think he ever laid one brick in his life? No, he commanded it. He made it happen. He paid for it. Ah, okay. Okay. Gotcha. Thanks so much. Crackerjack12, thanks to your super chat. They say, Kent Hovind is no con man. The atheist Kyle Curtis is a con man. Okay. That's uh, Jim Majors. Thanks. It was... Uh, it was the, there's like a feud going on right now. It was basically, they were, they didn't say you were, they said, Kent Hovind is no con man. The atheist Kyle Curtis is a con man, but that's a feud going on on line. Jim Majors, thanks for your, uh, super chat. He says, Kent, who are the sons of God, quote unquote, in Genesis 6, 4? Great question. I don't know. The Bible says in Genesis, there were sons, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and chose them. Uh, and intermarried with them and had children. And then it says, there, it all, and it says, and also after that, there were giants in the earth in those days. So the phrase, and also after that, might be separating that into two completely independent clauses. I don't know. I've, I've been a Christian 50 years, been reading the Bible a long time. I've read that a thousand times. My brain hurts when I think about it. I don't have an answer. But I, I, it says there were giants, and I believe that. Gotcha. Thanks so much. Next up. Maynard saves. Thanks for your question. According to the KJV, giants lived in the earth. Where in the earth did they live? Uh, I live in Alabama. Is he trying to imply under the crust of the earth by that question? If I say I live in Alabama, does that mean I live underground or within the borders of Alabama? I think when it says there were giants in the earth in those days, I think it's common sense 101 that there were giants, you know, on the, on, within the confines of what we call the earth. Hand me that globe there. Would so, uh, you know, like if someone says, I, I'm, I live in Alabama. Well, yeah, I live in Alabama. I actually live in Lenox, population 37. So uh, the Bible says there were giants in the earth in those days. Are they trying to, are they that desperate? They're going to try to say that that means they lived inside the earth? Come on, try again. Gotcha. Let's see. Maynard saves. Uh, thanks for your super chat. He says, did you see wolves give birth to poodles? How can you prove dogs come from wolves, Kent? I think uh, we could redo this today. I think dog breeders would tell you. Matter of fact, I had a family. I spoke. I forget where I was now, but this lady came up and said, Brother Hoven, my family's been in the dog breeding business for 100 years, four generations. She said, I, I can promise you, we've seen some changes in just, you know, 20 or 30 years it was with selective breeding for dogs. She said, if you gave us 50 generic mutts, we could recreate everything from Chihuahua to Great Dane in 100 years. That's, that was her testimony and the family doing it for 100 years. So uh, I think if we look at wolves and, and Chihuahuas or poodles, the illustration was, we would find the DNA gene code is extremely similar. Uh, lots of sim probably traceable back to say, hey, the, these have a common ancestor. Now, if this person asking the question would like to make the claim then that therefore poodles and giraffes and mosquitoes are related, I think that's insane, certifiably insane. I think we could, I think we could demonstrate that wolves could be uh, selectively bred if we kept choosing out the smaller ones. Every generation pick the babies that are smallest, let them grow up and interbreed, pick the smallest every time, or pick those that have slightly curlier hair every time. We're never going to change the hair to a feather, but we might select all curly-haired, smaller, poodle-shaped dogs. Sure. I believe that's intuitive that it could happen. I think we could demonstrate it within one human lifespan, since dogs can grow up, mature, and reproduce in, what, less than a year. Uh, so I think we have a generation time is short enough that one human in their lifetime could observe 50 or 60 generations of dogs and probably see some really bizarre results. You probably could get a Great Dane and a Poodle out of a common pair of mutts if you if you could give it 60 generations and try to selectively breed it for that person. That's what the Russians have done. 
with their breeding of foxes for the last 75 years, I believe it is, they've been getting foxes, letting them interbreed and selecting the tamest. They only, they only selected for one feature, tameness. Is it tame as opposed to wild? They now have foxes over there that act like dogs. They jump up on your lap. They want you to pet them. Just Google the Russian experiment on foxes. They have selected for tameness only in 75 years, and it succeeded. I think you could select wolves, babies, offspring, cubs, and get poodles in 100 years. I would say that's a reasonable. I couldn't prove it. I'm sure not going to try it. I think poodles are completely useless, but uh, I don't want a poodle around here. So I think, though, that I think any dog breed would say, oh, yeah, that could be done. Gotcha. Thanks so much. Uh, this, I don't know if we should read. that. This one's like a, it mentions Kent Hovind, but I'm not sure if it's actually about him. Uh, I think this is aiming at somebody else. Uh, Kent Hovind did his time. Atheists still call him a fraud. The atheist Kyle Curtis scams the atheist community, and the atheist community is silent. Wow. So, I don't know. It's kind of trollish uh, towards someone else. So, uh, well, let, let me respond, James, real stuff. quick. Let me respond and give Tom all the time he wants on this. It's obvious the atheists are getting very desperate, very desperate, when they start saying Kent Hovind went to prison and did time, which, of course, has nothing to do with the argument at all, okay? How many of the famous atheists and evolutionists over history did time in prison, okay? But I was completely unjustly arrested and sentenced in prison. There's a website called kenthovindisinnocent.com. I would challenge you, if you really want the truth, to go just at least watch DVD number three or video number three. I did not commit any crime. I did not do anything wrong. And we're still going to get it overturned. I'm going to die trying. Get that. I didn't. The government broke a hundred laws to put me in prison. I didn't break a single law about taxes or anything else. Had I withheld taxes from people working in the ministry, I would have broken the law. I was not authorized to withhold taxes. So anyway, we can get off that if you'd like. And Tom, you're welcome to comment. But I'm not a convicted fraud. I'm not a fraud at all. I was convicted. I was sentenced. I spent time in prison. It's over from the government side. They stole every, almost everything from me. And, but it's not over. I did not, that is, Jesus didn't do anything wrong. They crucified him. Lots of people. The Jews did nothing wrong. Hitler killed six million of them. Going to prison or being executed doesn't prove you're wrong on anything. And it certainly has nothing to do with the evolution argument. But go ahead, Tom. Yeah, I agree. I don't. The fact that anyone was in jail or did crime is irrelevant. All I care about is your arguments and whether or not your arguments are evidence. Whether or not you did crime is irrelevant. It doesn't make a difference. Gotcha. Uh, thanks for that. Even if I did a crime, even if I was criminal, that's it's irrelevant to the evolution right. argument. Right. Gotcha. And it, as a reminder, Kent Hovind has offered a debate on that topic. Nobody has taken him up. If somebody wants to, shoot us an email at modern day debate. Please at, do at gmail.com and we are willing to host it as he's made the offer so uh you'll be first in line brian g good evening james uh let's see oh that's got that one caustic soda i'm only gonna read like a couple more super chats because i and i'm sorry if we if you gave a super chat and we don't read it we frankly we've got a lot of them i'm trying to read the ones that like 10 20 dollared ones just to let our debaters to try to respect their time uh, Caustic Soda, if, thanks for your super chat. They said, if instructions are only, quote, um, observed to arise from intelligence, would it be right to infer the cause of DNA to be intelligence? If not, why when common ancestry is inferred and without observation? Uh, what was the first part? He said, if instructions are only observed, emphasizing it with all caps, to arise from intelligence, would it be... Const constructions is the word he used? Uh, they said if instructions are only ob instructions. only observed to arise from intelligence, would it be right to infer the cause of DNA to be intelligence? If not, why, when common ancestry is inferred and without observation? Uh, no, it's not instructions. It's information. Information is a property of matter. The Description of information is given by Claude Shannon in Information Theory, published in the paper like 1958, I think. Claude Shannon was an atheist. Information has nothing to do with the mind. It's all based off the stochastic systems and whether or not the stochastic systems can produce a differentiable pattern. So it has nothing to do with the mind in any field, not in biology, not in physics, not in mathematics. Information and all those things is a property of matter, not a property of mind. Gotcha. Thanks so much. 
And next up, Mr. Archaeopteryx, thanks for your super chat. He said, I asked for extra biblical miracle that you accept, but you brought up Abe Lincoln. You admitted that you don't accept Hindu or Muslim miracles. Is this special pleading? Well, let me answer that. I asked a, uh, a Muslim who'd been in, uh, studying Islam all of his life and was a very dedicated Muslim. I said, did Muhammad perform any miracles? Because Muhammad claimed to be a prophet. He said, yes. I said, what miracles did Muhammad perform? He said, he split the moon in half. The Muslims believe, at least this one who was pretty high up in the Muslim religion, one of Muhammad's miracles was he split the moon in half. A, where is the evidence for that? B, what on earth good does that do <laughs> to split the moon in half? I said, what else did Muhammad do? He said he made blood come out between his fingers one time. Those are the two miracles the Muslims believe that Muhammad did, split the moon in half and made blood come out of his fingers, between his fingers. I don't see how that makes any sense at all compared to Jesus feeding the 5,000 men plus women and children and raising the dead and raising himself from the dead. I mean, there are dozens and dozens of miracles at least reported in the Bible, which I believe to be exactly true. <clears throat> now, I can't verify any of them. We will one day. But certainly a lot of people who were there at the time claimed they saw it, just like a lot of people claimed they saw Abe Lincoln. I've never seen him. Gotcha. But I believe him. You bet. Thanks very much. And with that, we had uh, just as the Patreon priority question, we now have a Patreon where basically if you are a Patreon member, one of your questions will get to shoved to the top of the uh, list. Uh, Brian Stevens, thanks for your question. He says, would Kent, let's see. This is a, uh, it's hard to tell if this is sincere if or not. The, he said, would Kent debate if his PhDs are real? Oh, absolutely. Gotcha. Well, who, then. who gets who gets to make that decision? Do the people in Ireland decide <clears throat> whether they grant a degree from their university and call it a PhD, or do the people in America decide if the Irish have the right to do that? Gotcha. I think people in Ireland can make their own decision, can't they? And they can decide this guy has a PhD from an Irish university. Can a Christian university decide if they're going to grant a, a PhD? Or does, does Harvard have to decide if the Christians can do that? I'd be glad to debate that. And whether I got a PhD or not doesn't matter. I do have three earned and one honorary doctorate degree. Only one's a PhD, technically. The others are just doctorates. But yes, and that's not the point. The point is, who gets to decide, first of all? I'll tell you what. I will decide who has a legitimate degree. I don't think Stephen Gould had a legitimate degree. I don't think uh, Niles Eldridge had a legitimate degree because they believe we came from a rock. I don't think anybody who believes in evolution has a legitimate degree because they believe something so came from a rock, which came from nothing. Oh, um, Jim Majors had a question. Uh, did the Nephilim survive the flood? Did the Nephilim survive? Oh, you're asking me? No, only yeah. Noah's, uh, everybody alive today came from Noah and his family. And according to the scriptures, uh, whatever those giants were before the flood, Genesis 6, 4, they all died in the flood. So there would be nothing. Now, if if indeed the Nephilim were from fallen angels intermarrying the daughters of men, which is one common theory, which I don't know if it's true or not, then could they do it again after the flood? Uh, probably. Maybe that's how we got Bill Clinton. Gotcha. Thank you very much. We appreciate both of our speakers. We are glad to have them here. It's been a true pleasure. And want to let you know, just as a quick reminder, they have their links in the description. So if you enjoyed what you heard, feel free. Just go down to that little description box below, and you can click on their link and access their website or YouTube channel. And then last, we had a friendly uh, trolling super chat toward Tom that Steven Steen was just dying for me to read. So we appreciate that, Steen. And he said, Tom called me dumb. <laughs> so, oh, sorry, Steven. So there's your buddy. I responded to that. Like two, two, two messages later, I wrote, you're dumb. <laughs> Steven Steen, you're dumb. Well, we appreciate that. Uh, thanks for being here, everybody. want to encourage you to keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable.